One, two. One, two. It was in, okay. It wasn't up. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> the mic was on. Huh? Okay.
close the doors. If everyone would stand, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Prayer this morning will be offered by a good friend and colleague, one of the newer members to the bench eventually, the Honorable Delegate Kathy Vitale. Good to see you. Good, to see you. good morning, everyone. Good morning. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, it is you who determines our days. You hang the stars and feed the sparrows. You open doors no one can shut, and you shut doors that no one can open. We trust you when the time comes for making big decisions, or for that matter, any decisions. We know over the coming weeks our lives will be full of big decisions, and we are grateful for your presence. We will trust you for your generous wisdom, straight paths, and peaceful hearts. How we praise you for being the decision-making God, it's not our decisions, but yours that make the difference. We will plan, but we trust you to order our steps. We will pray, but ask that you fix our prayers en route. We will seek counsel, but count on you to overrule faulty or incomplete input from our most trusted friends and mentors and those that disguise themselves as such. Free us from making decisions primarily for our comfort and for others' approval on the fear of their disapproval. Free us to know that good choices don't always lead to the easiest outcomes, especially at first. And free us from second and 22nd guessing of our decisions. Father, make us more aware of the jobs ahead of us as we trust you for the opening and closing of doors that are in front of us, all for your glory in our daily activities. And in our whatevers, whenevers, and wherevers, thank you for being present with us, trusting us, and placing us today here in the chambers. Help us to make those good decisions. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Quorum call. Ms. Bigger. Has everyone recorded their presence? If so. Clark will. Has everyone recorded their presence? <laughs> if everyone's recorded their presence, the clerk will call the roll. Having out of the 34 members present of the House, and now in session, the clerk will read the journal from the previous day. Annapolis, Maryland, February the 10th, 2015. Mr. Speaker. Recognize Deputy Majority Leader. Thank you. Good morning. Move so much to be considered the reading of the journal. So ordered. Petition memorials and other papers. Hearing none. Introduction to House bills or committee assignments. Majority Leader. House Bill 490, Majority Delegate Moorheim, Health and Government Operations. Majority Leader. We have a consent calendar for the introduction of bills. We will recognize the majority leader for the consent calendar. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, so much. We consider the reading of House Bills 490 through 568. Without exception, so ordered. 490 to 568 have been entered. For bills. The... One, once again, a reminder, we're up to about 600 bills, and Thursday is the deadline for the guaranteed bill hearing schedule. Special order calendar. The clerk will read the first bill in the special order calendar. House Bill 46, Joint Committee on Fair Practices and State Personnel Oversight, Revisions, Favor Report Adopted. Our good friend, the maker of the motion, is our good friend from Harford and Baltimore County. Is our good friend from Harford and Baltimore County here? Recognized gentlelady. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it, uh, we got, I, I would ask that, um, on behalf of my colleague, if you could maybe uh, move it to the end of the agenda, if possible. Because um, he, he is here. We had a delegation meeting, and I think he's still, here he comes.
Way to save him, delegate. <laughs> Good catch. Our good friend, the delegate from Baltimore and Harford counties, is the special order calendar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your indulgence, and my colleagues, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, I have a few questions from the uh, floor leader on this, please. Uh, first of all, who requested this change in the language? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, this committee has existed since 1996. During this time, we have never received any issues related to procurement through the joint committee. And if there are any issues related to that and we need to provide oversight, it would go through our standing committee, HGO, which has a subcommittee that, that you know, specifically deals with procurement issues. So the reason why this uh, language is being striked from the current bill is because we're trying to match current practices with the current law. We've never dealt with issues related to this. It's outside of the purview of this committee. Okay, well, the reason I ask the question is there's a lot of talk here in the General Assembly and among others, and I serve on the committee you mentioned uh, in HGO, about the whole procurement process and uh, both sides of the aisle, I think, feel that there may need to be some reforms to make it better. And this week, uh, it was just announced in the news, a $6 million scandal in the MTA, uh, which is very serious, all related to procurement. So uh, if you feel that this is not necessary and that the procurement process can be uh, made better without this, uh, and apparently that's how the purpose of the legislation. Delegate, we do feel this is necessary, and again, I'd like to emphasize, it's the standing committee of HGO that we deal with the issues that you have just identified. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your answers. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate the indulgence. Any further questions to the bill or to its title? Any further questions to the bill or to its title? Hearing none, the bill is ordered, printed for third reading. We will have a joint session, obviously, with the Senate once again for the State of the Judiciary. That will take place at 11 o'clock. We will try to take committee announcements uh, before so we can be prepared to leave at the end of the State of the Judiciary. Chairman of Appropriations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Appropriations Committee will, meet, will not meet today. Uh, but subcommittees will be meeting. Listen for those announcements. Chair of Health and Government Operations. Thank you, Ms. Speaker. That committee will meet at 1 o'clock for briefings on estate and trust laws, register of wills, orphans court, followed by public bill hearing. The uh, Chair of the Environment and Transportation Committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Environment and Transportation Committee will continue public hearings at 1 p.m. this afternoon. The Chair Ways and Means. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. That committee will meet at 1 o'clock today to hear election bills and tax bills. Chair Judiciary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, the House Judiciary Committee will continue its public hearings at 1 p.m. Chair of Economic Matters. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The House Economic Matters Committee will meet at 1 o'clock for public bill hearings. 1 o'clock. Are there any subcommittee announcements? Subcommittee announcements. Chair of the Education and Economic Development Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, ec the <laughs> Education and Economic Development Subcommittee meets today in room 20 of appropriations. We will be hearing the budgets of the Department of, of, of DLR, Workforce Development, Maryland Stadium Authority, and MSDE headquarters. The uh, Chair of the Real Property Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Housing and Real Property Subcommittee will meet today in the Environment and Transportation Committee room directly after bill hearings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Chair of the Pension Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Subcommittee on Pensions will meet at 9 a.m. tomorrow. 9 a.m. Thank you. A, the Chair of the Transportation Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Subcommittee on Transportation and the Environment will meet today in room 145. 
at 1 o'clock, we'll hear the budget for the Maryland Environmental Services, Department of Agriculture, Public Service Commission, and the Office of the People's Council. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Health and Human Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Health and Human uh, Services Subcommittee on Appropriations will be meeting today at 1 o'clock in room 150 for a public hearing on the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any other subcommittee announcements? Subcommittee announcements. The chair of the subcommittee from Economic Matters. Oh, no, never mind. Any delegation announcements? Delegation announcements. The delegation uh, subcommittee from yeah, yeah. Prince George's County. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The delegation subcommittee by county will meet tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. in room 150, the Prince George's County delegation room. So that's 9 o'clock tomorrow morning by county subcommittee. Thank you. Any other? Delegation announcements, delegation announcements. Any caucus announcements, caucus announcements. Chair of the Black Caucus. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Legislative Black Caucus will meet tomorrow morning at 8.30 in room 145. Are there any other caucus announcements? Personal guest announcements before we go get the Senate. The Chair of the Baltimore City Delegation. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you very much and good morning. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Criminal Justice will meet tomorrow at 12 noon in the Judiciary Conference Room. So it's the Criminal Justice Subcommittee tomorrow, 12 noon, in the House Judiciary Conference Room. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, gentleman from Western Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome the community Mediation centers from all across the state of Maryland are here today. Please welcome them. You may have noticed they're purple uh, in recognition of the good work that they do for our state. I want to thank you for all your service. Are there any other personal gentlemen from Montgomery County? Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. If the body could join me in welcoming we have members of the Maryland Winery Association with us today. There's over 30 different wineries in attendance, and they're having a reception this afternoon from 5 to 7 at the Maryland Wine, Red Red Wine on Main Street, so I ask you to join them. So please give them a good hand for being with us this morning. Gentlemen from Baltimore County. Ladies and gentlemen, in the uh, gallery is a uh, friend of mine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We taught a course together at the Hopkins School of Public Health. He was born and raised in Baltimore City. He lives in District 21. He'll be here today. Please welcome David Fakunli in the gallery. The gentleman from Frederick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On behalf of the Frederick County Delegation, Frederick County Community College is on deck today, and we want to welcome them. Any other personal or guest announcements? The majority whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Frederick Christian Academy, who, who's joining us today. Would you stand if you're here? And also, Mr. Speaker, permission to use the delegate's name? Permission granted. Uh, delegate Shoemaker has invited, have invited a guest, and that is Mr. Andrew Gray. If he's here, please stand. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay. The majority leader. Uh, for an announcement, Mr. Speaker. For an announcement. Uh, just to alert the body that Maryland Community College students are here today throughout the building meeting with a lot of our offices, maybe some in the uh, hallways or up in the gallery, so for everyone to welcome them. All right, if there are no further guest announcements or personal announcements, we will ask the escorts to escort the Senate. If the escorts will... Come here to meet, to go escort the senators. Who, if you've been designated as an escort, please come to the front of the chamber.
If everybody could take a seat so we can introduce the Senate. If everyone takes a seat in the House, we now have the judges from the Court of, of Appeals. Everybody take a seat so we can greet the Senate. Mr. Sergeant in Arms. agree with that. All right, if everyone would take their seat. We will call on the President of the Senate to call roll. Mr. President. President. Okay, Senator folks. Astle. Okay, folks, if the Senate and House could come to order, please. Uh, Madam, if you'd call the roll, Mr. please. Mr. President, Senator Astle, Senator Bates, Senator Benson, Senator Broshin, Senator Cassily, Senator Conway, Senator Curry, Senator DeGrange, Senator Eckert, Senator Edwards, Senator Feldman, Senator Ferguson, Senator Gladden, Senator Gazzoni, Senator Hershey, Senator Huff, Senator Jennings, Senator Kagan, Senator Case Meyer, Senator Kelly, Senator King, Senator Klaus Meyer, Senator Lee, Senator Madalino, Senator Mano, Senator Mathias, Senator McFadden, Senator Middleton, Senator Montgomery, Senator Muse, Senator Nathan Pulliam, Senator Norman, Senator Peters, Senator Pinsky, Senator Pugh, Senator Ramirez, Senator Raskin, Senator Reedy, Senator Riley, Senator Rosapep, Senator Salling, Senator Sarafini, Senator Simon Eyre, Senator Waugh, Senator Young, Senator Zirkin. Mr. Speaker, members of the House, members of the Senate, quorum being present, the Senate of Maryland is again in session. Thank you, Mr. President. We can have a quorum call from the Maryland House of Delegates. Ms. Speaker. As everyone recorded their presence. If so, the clerk will call the roll. 
Having 136 members present, we are now in a joint session for the purpose of the state of the judiciary. If uh, the sergeant... Kristen, I don't have a list. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Mr. Sergeant Arms, not yet. Mr. Sergeant Arms. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Maryland General Assembly, the Chief Judge of the Maryland Court of Appeals, Aaron Allen Barbera.
Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Governor Hogan, President Miller, Speaker Bush, Senators and delegates, distinguished guests. Today marks the 21st occasion that a Chief Judge of Maryland has addressed this august body and the first since 2005. It is an honor to stand before you in what is my first State of the Judiciary Address. Thank you. Thank you. I am pleased to see so many old friends here today, and equally exciting is the number of new faces. At the outset, I wish to recognize my colleagues on the Court of Appeals. In descending seniority, they are Judge Glenn Harrell, Judge Lynn Battaglia, Judge Clayton Green, Judge Sally Atkins, Judge Robert McDonald, and Judge Shirley Watts. I am also pleased to introduce the other men and women in the judiciary's leadership. Judge Peter Krauser, Chief Judge of the Court of Special Appeals. Judge John DeBelius, Chair of the Conference of Circuit Court Judges. <laughs> Judge John Morrissey, Chief Judge of the District Court. <laughs> and our State Court Administrator, Pam Harris. <laughs> I am privileged to speak today, not just for those present in this historic chamber, but also for those who serve daily as the true lifeblood of our judiciary, our 300 trial and appellate judges, and the more than 4,000 women and men who staff our courthouses throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you on their behalf. How does one measure the state of the judiciary? It must be by reference not only to the quality of the justice we dispense, but also to the vigor, the vigor with which we pursue the ideal of achieving justice for all. That is our charge from those we serve, the people of Maryland. To paraphrase Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, providing mere access to the courthouse door is not enough. It is far more than that, ladies and gentlemen. It is what happens beyond the entrance, in the hallways, in the clerk's offices, in the courtrooms. Much has changed in our state in the 10 years since the last chief judge addressed this body. Our population has grown by roughly 10%. We are more culturally diverse, and we have become technologically savvy. At the same time, the income gap among the people of Maryland has widened. The judiciary's obligation, therefore, is to identify and respond to the many and varied needs of all those who access our courts. We cannot afford to rely on old systems and approaches. We must be prepared for today. We must be prepared for tomorrow. President Abraham Lincoln said that progress is only possible with the willingness to think anew and to act anew. Your judiciary, ladies and gentlemen, is doing just that. Today, I will update you on the progress we have made and will be making beyond the courthouse doors, whether that is holding ourselves accountable for timely decisions, adapting to the new world of technology, thinking outside the box to increase the public's access to justice, or addressing the needs of the most vulnerable among us. We are and will be thinking anew. The Maryland Constitution confers upon me an array of responsibilities as Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals and the Administrative Head of the Judicial Branch. I have not only the opportunity to engage in the legal matters before Maryland's State Supreme Court, but also to consider what advances we might make to improve the delivery of justice. 
My duties have positioned me to lead the judiciary into a new era. Marylanders want and deserve a court system they can trust, one that treats them fairly and with respect in their dealings with the courts. Studies show, and by now it is well understood, that people will accept judicial outcomes, even if adverse to their side of the case, if they believe that they have been treated fairly and with respect. Put simply, process counts. Therefore, we are taking steps to ensure as best we can that all who enter our courthouses are given the courtesy and the respect to which they are entitled. We continually educate ourselves about best practices in all interactions with the public, customer service, if you will. We are also on the lookout for ways to make our public spaces more accessible and more easily negotiated. Also essential to maintaining the public's trust and confidence in the courts is adaptability. Over time, as our society changes, so too does our approach to the cases before the courts. Not all case types are best handled in the traditional courtroom hearing or trial setting. Programs such as problem-solving courts seek to redress with an eye toward reducing recidivism the root causes that lead some people to repeatedly violate the law. We have recognized that the way we handle these cases must conform to modern sensibilities. It has paid off. During the past few decades, we have come to realize the savings in dollars, certainly, but more important, more important, in lives saved. By utilizing a more targeted and holistic approach to addressing the particular causes and challenges that are faced by repeat offenders, we are achieving justice. Drug courts provide just one example of a number of innovative approaches to addressing more effectively matters that come before the courts. According to the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, taxpayers save $3.36 for every dollar invested in drug courts nationwide. The benefits, though, do not end there. Parents who participate in drug courts are twice as likely to complete treatments as one who do not. Their children spend less time in out-of-home placements, and perhaps most important, nationally, 75% of drug court participants remain arrest-free for two years after graduation. Allow me to share one graduate story, that of a young man I shall call J.D. Ten years ago, ladies and gentlemen, J.D. dealt drugs and he stole to feed his daily addiction to heroin. Not surprisingly, J.D. bounced in and out of jail on numerous occasions and he was close to losing his life at age 29. With judges, prosecutors, the public defender, probation officers, and social workers all coordinating their efforts, J.D. has worked his way through the program, and he dedicated himself to completing it. J.D. is one of many great success stories, ladies and gentlemen. I'm proud to announce that he is still sober seven years later, and he is paying it forward. J.D. is gainfully employed. He is interning with the Frederick County Drug Court Program, and he is on course to graduate from Frederick County Community College later this year. It's a wonderful story for J.D. Thank you. Thank you for J.D. and the many um, who are like situated. Our first drug court uh, opened in 1994 in Baltimore City. We now have 36 operational drug courts statewide. We are realizing the benefits by reducing costs associated with arrest, court, and imprisonment. More important, 
more important, we are helping families remain intact and in time heal. Our problem-solving courts, though, go well beyond helping those who are addicted to drugs. We have expanded to add three mental health courts, two re-entry courts, a veterans court pilot, and nine truancy reduction courts. Those programs have produced, and I have no doubt will continue to produce, individual success stories like JD's. Maryland also has been in the forefront in the way our courts interact with the business and high-tech communities. We became one of a handful, a handful of states to create a business and technology case management program. This program provides timelier, more predictable, and reliable dispositions of cases. That, in turn, helps the business community make more informed decisions. Timeliness, efficiency, and reliability, though, must be an aspiration of all case types, and by those measures, a barometer of accountability for the judiciary. Many of you have heard the phrase, justice delayed is justice denied. With those words in mind, 15 years ago, the court system embarked upon a mission, a mission to establish and implement standards by which to gauge performance and thereby garner the public's trust that their cases will be decided timely. And not long after I became chief judge, the Court of Appeals, all seven of us, we demonstrated our commitment to delivering the our decisions in a timely fashion without sacrificing the quality of the decision making. <laughs> Last year, the court decided every one of the cases that it heard during the same term in which it was heard. And the court will continue that practice this term and in future terms. But the Court of Appeals is not alone, not alone in the timely delivery of justice. Thanks to the efforts of so many, there are now standards by which the entire court experience can be measured at every level of court, from the district court through and to the Court of Appeals. Now, I cannot leave the subject of improving court operations without mentioning our new Maryland electronic courts MDEC. We are indeed thinking and acting anew. Businesses and individuals alike are constantly, you know this, using computers. We use computers, we use smartphones and the internet to perform even the most routine daily tasks. Our justice system, however, still operates through traditional, often cumbersome, paper-based processes. Our courthouses are quickly running out of storage space. We are, in effect, bursting at the seams with case files. Equally troubling, the judiciary operates 11 different computer systems across the, straight, uh, across the state. In some cases, ladies and gentlemen, these systems are more than 25 years old, and supporting them, no surprise, has become increasingly more difficult. That is why the judiciary, with critical support from the General Assembly, with your support, ladies and gentlemen, we have made a great investment with MDEC. We will transform the way we conduct business. You recognized, you recognized, as we did, that Maryland must use technology not simply to improve efficiencies, but for the betterment the betterment of those who we and our justice partners serve. Thank you. Thank you. We are just a few months into what ultimately will be our statewide deployment of MDEC. So here I would like to pause to thank Anne Arundel County. The courts there have accepted the challenge to, dare I say it, boldly go where no court has gone before. 
thank you for those of you who uh, are of the age to know. A brave new mission indeed. The, Mara, the Anne Arundel County Courts are serving as our proving ground. There have been some kinks along the way, yet our judges and staff continue to answer the call with extraordinary patience, flexibility, and resilience as we advance in implementing MDEC. And folks, the rest of the courts throughout Maryland, all of our courts, will be the beneficiaries of their hard and good work. My friends from Anne Arundel County are here. Hello, thank you. <laughs> MDEC will improve efficiency to be sure, yet not simply for its own sake, but rather to deliver better and more cost effective service to the many individuals and businesses our courts serve every day, all the people who access our courts every day. I hope that during this session and in the future, you will continue to help us realize our vision. I know you will. Modern technology can especially benefit those who need it most, the people who seek redress in our courts but cannot afford a lawyer. We are all proud Marylanders. We are proud Marylanders, and we are fortunate to live in a wonderfully diverse state. The rich diversity of our population enhances our communities, doesn't it? And likewise, presents us with some unique challenges. With so many of us living very different lives, under very different circumstances, we must think in a new way about how to support our varied population as efficiently and as effectively as possible. This is especially true at a time when more people are coming to the court without a lawyer. So to ease some of the common burdens we face, they face and we face them too, we have created the Access to Justice Department within the judiciary. This new department will break down barriers that inhibit full access to the courts. Those barriers may relate to physical challenges, to cultural differences, or the lack of affordable legal representation. We have developed tools for the public to overcome those obstacles. This involves everything from, say, self-help videos, to brochures, to the translation of forms, or increasing the number of readily available interpreters. In addition, we are fortunate to have the resources of the District Court Self-Help Center here in Glen, in Glen Burnie, here in Anne Arundel County, as well as 24 family law self-help centers around the state. These centers are places where anyone can go, anyone can go to access not only walk-in assistance, but phone and live web chat services. In 2014 alone, the District Court Self-Help Center in Glen Burnie served 23,000 people, of which more than 18,000 were assisted remotely from across the state. Meanwhile, our family law centers assisted more than 49,000 people statewide. Numbers like these demonstrate why, just why, we must provide tools to the members of the public who cannot afford a lawyer. But we do need to do more. Estimates show that in Maryland alone, only about 22% of civil legal needs are being met. In an effort to meet those needs, the judiciary is seeking ways to expand the scope and the services of the 24 family law self-help centers at the circuit court level and add regional district court centers. I am pleased and proud to announce that on February 23rd, just a few days from now, we are holding an event to celebrate the opening of a new district court self-help center in Prince George's County. I hope every one of you will join us there. Thank you. These new initiatives are exciting 
and certainly meet the Justice Marshall test of going beyond the courthouse door. However, I recognize that building on the public's trust and confidence in our legal system is more than just expanding and improving access to the courts. So in the coming years, I intend to focus particular attention on the most vulnerable among us, and those are our children and our seniors. Young children are vulnerable, of course, simply because they cannot fend for themselves. Many of the oldest among us are rendered vulnerable by physical or mental infirmities that lead them directly or indirectly into our courts. Before I, becoming a lawyer, I taught young children in the Baltimore City public schools. In working with those children and with their families, I witnessed the challenges confronting some of them. As a lawyer and now a judge, I see many of the same and worse challenges that undermine far too many of our children's potential to lead healthy and productive lives. Every day in Maryland, young children, some no more than a few days old, ladies and gentlemen, enter the court system as the result of abuse or neglect at the hands of an adult. These children may well have to spend time, often years, in a foster care placement. In later years, those same children are at a higher risk of truancy, drug or alcohol addiction, and mental health issues. Juvenile delinquency and adult criminal behavior are more likely to follow for these children than for others who are more fortunate. Consider the possible effects, the terrible costs to the children themselves, to the community that loses the participation of a law-abiding and productive adult, to the system that must process and house some of them in secure juvenile facilities and ultimately, sadly, for far too many of them, prison. We simply cannot afford to ignore the damage done to these young people and by extension, truly, to all of us. Action must be taken, and with your help, I know it will be done. I am pleased to announce that in May, in conjunction with the National Center for State Courts, I will be hosting the Mid-Atlantic Conference on Juvenile Justice Reform for Chief Justices and their staff. This conference is part of the MacArthur Foundation's Models for Change initiative. Some of you may be familiar with it. It was launched nationally to stimulate a new wave of comprehensive juvenile justice reform. I expect that this event will help us to improve our understanding of the science associated with adolescent development to better rehabilitate juveniles and to reduce recidivism in this population. Reform is only possible, as with all things, if we work together. I look forward to those possibilities, working with you, our legislature, Governor Hogan, President Miller, and Speaker Bush. And again, I have not and will not forget all of you. At the other end of the generational spectrum, the other end of the generational spectrum, is the increase the courts will see in elderly litigants. Millions of people in Maryland are on the verge of entering their golden years, and we must be cognizant of the challenges this presents for all of us. It is projected that in the near future, there will be a four-fold increase in the number of people who are 80 years old or older, a four-fold increase. Sadly, what is sure, none of us in this room, of course. <laughs> Sadly, what is sure to rise is the number of incidents where our vulnerable adults fall victim to financial or even physical abuse, sometimes at the hands of a caregiver or even 
very sadly, a family member. Consider, too, that this population is reluctant to access the courts for a variety of reasons, including family loyalty, fear, or the shame that is associated with the transition from independence to dependence. I look forward to the progress we can make together. I know that you believe, as I do, that we each have the responsibility to work shoulder to shoulder in service of every one of our Maryland, Maryland citizens. This year, we celebrate the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. The rights declared in that document became part of our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. So it is that our country is founded on the rule of law. It forms the basis, ladies and gentlemen, of much, much of what each one of us in this chamber today is sworn to do. Our legislative branch, you, you enact the law. Our executive branch enforces the law. The judicial branch interprets the law. As we devote ourselves to our work each day, and as we approach our challenges, each of us from our unique vantage point, allow me to make a humble proposal. That we remain ever cognizant of the panoramic view. A great judge once said of the myopic man or woman, such a person would be like the man who thinks he is just pushing a wheelbarrow when in fact, he is building a cathedral. The great cathedrals have endured for hundreds of years and will last for hundreds more. Little did each worker know that the true measure of his or her contribution would be looked upon for centuries later, not just as a single act, but as the product of, our, of a collective effort. So, as each of us pushes along his or her wheelbarrow. We cannot forget that together, together, we are building something greater. We are working in concert to build a cathedral, a great cathedral. My colleagues and I within the judiciary will continue to push our wheelbarrow, as I know you will push yours. Along the way, I hope that we pause and we take a moment to build on our commonalities and that we complement each other even where and when we differ. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how enduring works are built. The judiciary is doing well, and it is making strides in becoming smarter, more efficient, and increasingly accessible to the public. The future presents challenges and opportunities alike, and the time is ripe. It is ripe for reasoned and thoughtful reforms. So I look forward to working with all of you on behalf of the people of Maryland. Thank you for your time and your attention. I wish each and every one of you a most productive session. Thank you. If the escorts would come forward for Chief Judge Barbera. Judge, I'll have you know all the escorts are aspiring lawyers. Uh, so <laughs> if the escorts would come forward for Governor Hogan, thank you for being here, Governor. The escorts would come forward for the Senate. We turn it over to the Senate President. Oh, Court of Appeals. Excuse me. I don't know if we have escorts for you, but <laughs> stage left. <laughs> Mr. President. You'll recognize the uh, majority leader of the Maryland Senate.
And Mr. President Pro Tem, thank you very much. Senator Maryland stands adjourned until 10 a.m. Thursday morning. As the Senate of Maryland adjourns, uh, the Maryland House of Delegates will also take a quorum call before adjournment. Quorum call. Mr. Speaker. As everyone in the Maryland House of Delegates recorded their presence, if so, the clerk will call the roll. Having 138 members present, the House is still in session, recognize the majority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that the House stands adjourned until Thursday, February 12th at 10 a.m.